Hi, I'm Mike Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is labels and the habit many people have developed of sticking the label of anti-Semite on anyone who disagrees with them. Calling Donald Trump, the President of the United States, an anti-Semite has been a trope of many Jewish communal leaders and members of the media. Mainstream Democrats have now joined these groups and taken up the call. These Democrats joined the chorus following the President's comments about Democrat voting Jews showing disloyalty. I'm not an apologist for the President. I have been critical of many of Donald Trump's statements, decisions, and actions. At the same time, there are many things about which I have been very supportive. I'm an equal opportunity critic and supporter. And the charge that President Trump is an anti-Semite is ridiculous. There are so many reasons why the trope is ridiculous that it feels ludicrous to even discuss the subject. But discuss it we must. Trump is not a liberal. There, neither does he come from a liberal family. His points of view often fly in the face of traditional liberal mainstream Jewish communities, just as they fly in the face of traditional liberal mainstream non-Jews. But honestly, and this should be very clear, there are enough true anti-Semites out there that they are on both sides of the political aisle, by the way. We do not have to create new Jew haters where they do not exist. That's not to say that some of Trump's statements have not been energized and activated racists and anti-Semites. Most recent case in point, obviously, is his responses to the request of Rashida Talib and Ilan Omar to visit Israel. These Trumpisms were spouted in response to what the president viscerally understood to be the blatant anti-Semitism of the Congresswomen. Trump's comments, both the original and his follow-up statement, were pretty vague, so vague that one cannot determine if he meant disloyal to Israel, disloyal to him, disloyal to the, their Jewish roots. I would guess he meant the last, disloyal to Judaism. Anti-Trumpers are never at a loss to find ways to attack the president. Most people, regular people, not just politicians and world leaders, would never have written or uttered that statement. But Trump is Trump. He sees the world pretty clearly, but he sees it through his own prism. And Donald Trump's love of Israel and love for the Jewish people is front and center. They are an intrinsic part of his character and date way back before his daughter's conversion and subsequent marriage and birth of his Jewish grandchildren. On the parallel track to calling Donald Trump an anti-Semite is the newly emerging and equally ill-conceived school of thought that criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitic. The argument for that line of thinking, which has been gaining traction in non-Jewish and Jewish worlds uh, is don't label every criticism and critic of Israel an anti-Semite. As an example, proponents of the erroneous thinking will often point to former President Barack Obama and say that Obama was a great lover of Israel, but he was also a vocal critic. He would say, quote, friends need to call friends out when they make mistakes, unquote. That may be true. But, and it's a big and important but, some people couch their anti-Semitism as criticism of Israel. It's their protective cloak. After all, it's safer and much more politically correct to be critical of a country than it is to criticize a religion or a people. There are two factors that determine if a person is criticizing Israel and whether or not they're anti-Semites. First, does the critique allow for Israel to exist or does it suggest that if Israel were not there, the problem would be solved. Second is the tone of the critique. Tone is everything. Critique is done with respect and love and is immediately identifiable. That kind of critique does not seek to harm or destroy, but rather to help and to assist. We call it constructive criticism, and it is a time-honored tool of educators and parents. Much of the recent and very vocal public criticism of Israel does not stand up to these two factors. Certainly, U.S. Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib fits into the category of anti-Semite. Pay attention to what Trump said and how he said it, and it will become obvious that these two factors are not at all present in the comments of Donald Trump. Some Israelis are attempting to explain the anti-Semitic tropes aimed at Trump by fellow Israelis and Jews following his, quote, loyalty statement, unquote, by saying that those people are actually self-hating Jews. I don't buy it. 
the Jews are saying these things very much like themselves. And they like others who share their point of view and want many more people to share their point of view with them. Self-hating Jews are haters. They don't like and are embarrassed by proud Jews, Israeli Jews, Jewish Jews, Republican Jews, and especially Jews who like Trump. And that includes Israelis who like Trump. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. There's no question about it. It needs to be confronted, not manufactured. It is present on the right and on the left. And good people on both sides of the aisle should unite to fight the scourge that does not discriminate because of political allegiance or national allegiance. It's anti-Semitism. Because you disagree with someone about Israel or with someone who is Jewish, you are not an anti-Semite. We have real variables to evaluate the anti-Semitic claim. Comments made by Talib and Omar have been neither nuanced nor vague. They are blatantly anti-Semitic. Donald Trump's comments are not. I've also been thinking about well-meaning but totally miscalculated foreign policy decisions. President Emmanuel Macron of France chose to spice up an otherwise news-weary, insignificant, downright boring G7 meeting by inviting Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif to attend. That move by Macron was not only a significant show of strength and grit, it was also a clear shot across the bow of the United States President Donald J. Trump. With one gesture, France successfully deflated U.S. international foreign policy bluster about keeping Iran further than at arm's length, keeping the Persian nation in isolation. Don't for a minute, however, believe that Trump was caught totally off guard by the Iranian visit. He may not have been consulted, but he was given at least a little lead time, enough to compose himself and compose an appropriate diplomatic response. Macron wanted center stage. He wasn't going to let Trump steal his moment. Whether it was his brilliant implicit intention or an unintended quixotic sidebar, we must be witnessing the first step in U.S.-Iranian rapprochement. Or maybe not. Macron's move presented Iran and the United States with a low-key, as if by the way, opportunity to start to contemplate what might perhaps become a face-to-face sit-down in the possible near future. No one is committing to anything, but the first move has been made. Iran has not publicly changed their stance. Iranian leadership still maintains that any dialogue with the United States is out of the question until the United States lifts sanctions. This has been the Iranian trope since 2015. But we know from the recent experience that just because a country sings a single song, they might not one day be convinced to change their tune. Look no further than North Korea. North Korea had the same official response about face-to-face diplomatic dialogue with the United States, as does Iran. And then, in what seemed to be out of the blue, face-to-face meetings, not between underlings or emissaries, but between the country's top leaders. And while the prospect of diplomatic ties between the United, and Iran, the United States and Iran might be heartening news for large swaths of the world, there is one tiny coin of the world that is not diplomatically or militarily speaking smiling on this union. The move by Emmanuel Macron of France and the follow-through by Donald Trump has Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel worried, seriously worried. President Trump announced that he would gladly meet with his Iranian counterpart, President Rouhani. If that happens, if the United States advances towards Iran in a path similar to the path the United States has advanced towards North Korea, it will mean that dialoguing with Iran will be a priority, and that will weaken Israel's ability to influence the United States vis-a-vis the demands on Iran. Israel has a series of priorities for their country's security. Keeping the Jewish nation safe from Iran's hostilities is atop that list. There are certain red lines in the sand that Israel wants to make certain the United States does not allow Iran to cross. Since the G7 meeting, Israeli analysts and security strategists have been huddling to predict the all potential outcomes, all of them, from this move by Macron. Israel would be most pleased if nothing happens. And that might be the case. But that is not the most likely scenario right now. However, one big difference between North Korea and Iran is that Iran is ruled by a supreme leader and an extremely conservative religious hierarchy. And North Korea is ruled by one dictatorial man. While Kim Jong-un has the ability to unilaterally choose to sit with Trump as often as he wishes, yet in Iran it is unlikely 
after a first move by Macron, extremist voices within Iran will allow any future dialogue. Iranians are split between conservatives and liberals. The conservatives rule with an iron fist and accepting even a second meaning which shows support for liberal ideas, like engaging the outside world. Iran's conservatives reject that model. But Israel realizes that despite all the obstacles, the United States wants to entice Iran to talks. They know that the president is, in, is doing this by business. That's what his model is. Donald Trump places a huge premium on face-to-face -face meetings as a way to break down disputes and clear proverbial, the proverbial air to resolve tensions. Any dialogue with Iran would throw Israel's security paradigm into free fall. A monodimensional Iran sworn to Israel's destruction in a head-to-head -head confrontation with Israel's ally, the United States, is simpler to defend against and speak about. That, Iran is e that kind of Iran is easier to understand. Talks will not change Iran's point of view, but they will make it much harder for the United States to keep pressure on Iran. With talks, the United States has the additional agenda of advancing more talks, looking the other way, and maybe even surreptitiously delivering support to Iran. Israel's fear, their real fear, is that the United States will fall into its default classic position of managing the Iranian situation instead of solving it. And that was the policy of U.S. President's administrations up until now. It stems from the arrogance of the United States foreign policy, the belief that all problems can be managed. In contrast to their nemesis, Israel, that's exactly the approach that Iran is hoping for. For Iran, it would return back to the new old situation. The United States would feel empowered, but the Iranians would be in charge. The Iranians would be driving the relationship. A diplomatic warming between the United States and Iran is not good news for Israel, not good news for the United States, not good news for the world. It plays into U.S. weakness. It's Achilles' heel. Believe me, Iran knows this. Coming up next, points of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. We're going to look at three columns today, one from Dennis Prager in The Jewish Week, printed on August 20th, one from Haaretz, it's a farewell column by Bradley Burston, printed on April 22nd, and one from The Washington Examiner, dated July 29th. First up is Dennis Prager's column from The Jewish Press. Dennis Prager is a nationally syndicated radio show host, the creator of PragerUniversity.com. His latest book is Still the Best Hope, why the World Needs American Values to Triumph. Even more significant is his web info program called Prager University. It gets millions of hits, and it is an injection of reality about history, politics, and more. There are many courses which run seven to 10 minutes each. Prager has a huge impact on a young generation that prefers short snippets to long explanations, and which certainly would never read a book on the subject. Prager takes on a familiar point in this column, anti-Israel versus anti-Semitism. We have discussed this plenty, but Prager does an excellent job, and it is worthwhile seeing his point of view. This is how he begins. Imagine a group of people who work to destroy Italy because they claim Italy's origins are illegitimate. Imagine further that these people maintain that of all the countries in the world, only Italy is illegitimate. And then imagine that these people vigorously deny they are in any way anti-Italian. Would you believe them, or would you dismiss their argument as not only dishonest, but absurd? Substitute Israel for Italy and Jew for Italian, and you'll understand the dishonesty and absurdity of the argument that one can be anti-Zionist but not anti-Semitic. But that is precisely what the anti-Zionists say. They argue that the very existence of a Jewish state in the geographic area known as Palestine there was never an independent country known as Palestine, is illegitimate. They do not believe any other country in the world is illegitimate, no matter how bloody its origins. And then they get offended when they're accused of being anti-Semitic. Now Dennis Prager gives five reasons why they are really anti-Semites. We should go through them quickly so that you understand and see them. First, he says, they change the topic. They say it's unfair to charge those who merely criticize Israel with being anti-Semitic. But I don't know anyone who does that. It's a phony argument. Criticism of Israel is fine. Denying Israel's right to exist is not. Anti-Zionism is not criticism of Israel. Anti-Zionism is opposition to Israel's existence. Second, 
anti-Zionists claim that they can't be anti-Jewish because Zionism has nothing to do with Judaism. That too is equally false. It is the same as saying that Italy has nothing to do with being Italian. Judaism has always consisted of three components, God, Torah, and Israel. If Israel isn't part of Judaism, <laughs> neither is Bible or God. Third, anti-Zionists claim that Judaism is only a religion, therefore Jews are only members of a religion, not a nation. But the Jews are called the nation of Israel, repeatedly in the Bible. That is why there are irreligious, secular, and even atheist Jews, because Jews are not only a religion. There are no atheist Christians because Christianity is only a religion. Fourth, anti-Zionists claim that Israel is illegitimate because it is racist. This is the charge Israel and American haters make against two of the least racist societies in the world. Fifth, anti-Zionists claim that Israel's origins are illegitimate. The fact that of all the world's 200 plus countries, the only country anti-Zionists declare illegitimate is also the only Jewish country is pretty much all you need to know about their motives. Why, for example, don't they make this claim about Pakistan? In 1947, nine months before the establishment of Israel, India was partitioned into a Muslim state, Pakistan, and the Hindu state, India. Now Prager concludes with the argument that the mere fact that they only reject Israel proves that they are anti-Semites. Given these facts, why is Israel's legitimacy challenged while the legitimacy of Pakistan isn't? There's only one answer. Israel is the one Jewish state in the world. So while there are 49 Muslim-majority countries, 22 Arab states, anti-Zionists reject the right of the one Jewish state, the size of New Jersey, to exist. Of course, not all anti-Zionists hate all Jews. But as I wrote at the beginning, if you seek to destroy Italy, you are anti-Italian, even if you don't hate every Italian. And if you seek to destroy the only Jewish state on earth, you're an anti-Semite, even if you don't hate every Jew. Next up is a column from Haaretz. It is a farewell, a final column of a longtime respected columnist, Bradley Burston. Bradley is a great stylist, and throughout his career, he has never shied away from raising important issues. He was, in many ways, a moral compass for many who read him. The column was published on April 22nd. It's entitled, This is my farewell column. I salute my brave colleagues in Israel and around the world. Subtitled, Journalists, they help save the world from itself. They are warriors. Prize them. They're your best shot. Burston says, thanks. And here is how he begins. This will be my last weekly column for Haaretz. It's time for me to retire, not at all at the in initiative of Haaretz, solely at my own, not at all with sadness, but with a very deep, very full, very clear well of gratitude. It's an honor to be a journalist. It has been and is to this day my privilege to work with wondrous people, people of rare bravery and indistinguishable fire and heightened senses and hardened exteriors and open hearts and fingertips touched by God. I prize them. I love them. They help save the world from itself. I'm thrilled by the younger writers now taking their rightful place at the heart of this profession. They are what real journalists have to be, warriors. Burston is making way for newer, fresher, younger thinkers. He should be commended. He will be missed. Finally, the third piece up is from the Washington Examiner. It's by Mike Brest and is entitled Flashback, GOP House Member Joe Scarborough Introduced Resolution Condemning Al Sharpton. It was published on July 29, 2019. It is a funny piece because it describes what has happened over the past few years. Things have gotten out of control. Judge for yourself. This is how Brest begins. Joe Scarborough introduced a resolution to condemn Al Sharpton back in 2000 when Scarborough represented Florida in the House of Representatives. Nearly 20 years after the resolution was introduced, President Trump attacked Sharpton, and many have jumped to his defense, despite the spotty history that Scarborough referenced in the resolution. The resolution, titled Condemning the Racist and Anti-Semitic Views of Reverend Al Sharpton, read in part, whereas the Congress strongly rejects the racist and incendiary actions of the Reverend Al Sharpton, 
whereas the Reverend Al Sharpton has referred to members of the Jewish faith as blood-sucking Jews and Jew bastards, whereas the Reverend Al Sharpton has referred to members of the Jewish faith as white interlopers and diamond merchants. Wow, how times and sentiment have changed. Enough said. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. Today I want to share two Pictoons. Remember, Pictoons are pictures with captions. They both deal with Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and Ilan Omar and their trip to Israel. They both come from the website called Powerline Blog from August 17, 2019. The first has two Congresswomen sitting making faces. The picture is real. It was actually during the President Trump's State of the Union speech where all the Democrats were wearing white, if you remember. The caption reads, when you tell the world to boycott Israel, and Israel boycotts you back. Second cartoon is in three parts. The bottom shows two pictures, one of Talib and one of Omar. Above the pic those pictures is the famous soup Nazi from Seinfeld, the Seinfeld TV show. He was notorious for barking the following expression, no soup for you, no soup for you if you violated any of his protocols. In the Pictoon, he is shouting to the Congresswomen, no Israel for you. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. The five nations that surround the oil-rich Caspian Sea or lake, depending on your perspective, met to figure out how to divide the great natural wealth, oil wealth, that lies there. Russia, Iran, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, and Kazakhstan all have a stake. Russia and Iran are most insecure about what might happen. Because of that insecurity, they have not ratified an agreement that was drawn up last year. And the other three countries are waiting for Russia and Iran to make the moves, the first moves, and sign. Both Iran and Russia are afraid that this newly found oil would change the supply of oil in the world. They are particularly worried about Western countries that are urging the construction of a Caspian natural gas pipeline that will bring that oil over land from the, west, uh, from the Caspian Sea to the West, especially to Western Europe. Iran and Russia need to preserve their reserves, keep the supply down, and make certain that the price of oil stay high. Israel and Hezbollah are dancing on a tightrope. A false move could result in an all-out war. Israel has targeted Hezbollah's uh, targets linked to Iran. They knew that Hezbollah would have to retaliate, so they laid a trap. Israel moved an army post forward and brought an ambulance into the post. Hezbollah took the opportunity and blasted the post and the ambulance with cornet missiles. Helicopters from Israel came to evacuate the post, as did army medics and teams. But it was all a ruse. No one was injured, no one was in the post, no one was manning the ambulance. Here's the problem. Nasrallah must redeem himself to the Lebanese masses. But was this attack on what turned out to be Israel's fake army base enough to keep his name and his reputation as the defender against Israeli aggression? If Nasrallah does not sense that he has the support of the people of Lebanon, he will have to attack Israel again, and he will need to attack big. That move has the potential increase to increase the intensity on the ground and may very well ignite and spiral into a war with Israel. Morocco's first Holocaust memorial, located just outside of Marrakesh, the country's largest city, has been destroyed. A year after construction began, the memorial was almost completed when a bulldozer hired by the local municipality came and mowed it all down. Morocco's Holocaust memorial was sponsored by a German group dedicated to teaching the lessons of the Holocaust and creating bridges between people. The name of the group is Pixel Helper. A memorial received media coverage, and the media coverage caused blowback. The ostensible reason for its destruction was that the construction was not legal. The real reason was that those who were challenging the memorial claim that their government is getting too close to Israel, and this memorial was further proof. The shame is, that Jews of the Arab world were murdered under the Nazis. They were attacked, ghettoized, and even deported under the Nazis. And this was intended, the memorial was intended to be a memorial for those Jews and also for the uh, LGBT community that was also targeted by the Nazis. Pixel Helper is raising money to rebuild 
in Morocco. The Russian news agency RAI has reported that Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov hosted the Iranian counterpart, Foreign Minister Javid Zarif, on Monday, September 2nd. The meeting was in Moscow. Maria Zakharova, the spokeswoman of the Russian Foreign Ministry, was quoted in the report. We must presume that the two most certainly discussed the three most burning issues. On the agenda was certainly the security situation in the region, especially the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz. They most certainly discussed the issue of Iran's nuclear development. And finally, they absolutely discussed each other's role in Syria. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that we really do not spend enough time speaking and learning about the experiences of Jews from the Arab world who suffered under the Nazis? But we should. We should spend time learning about this very important part of Jewish history. It is often overwhelmed by the history of Eastern European Jews during the Holocaust. But it is important to learn and understand. The Jews of Arab lands experience was very different from the Jews of Europe. Actually, every country was different, every community was different, every person's story was different. In large strokes, it is important that we know that Hitler's Nazi forces and policies made their way to the Middle East. In many cases, there too, Jews were ghettoized, persecuted, and murdered. In many cases, they were deported. It is important to understand that while the main plan for the murder of the Jews in its first stage was Europe's Jews, the Nazis were also planning to murder all Jews. The Jews of the Middle East were victims too, albeit in a very different style. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Alpert. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.